今天请到的嘉宾是 UCSF 三藩市加州大学医院的乳房癌专科医师 Dr. John Chen 为我们介绍这一方面的资讯。So, Dr. Chen, you have such an impressive resume from Stanford and Harvard University, and now working at one of the nation's best hospitals. I understand that you're very busy, so I really appreciate your time today. Now, can you tell us if UCSF offers different treatments for breast cancer patients compared to other hospitals in the Bay Area, or is it treating breast cancer patients fairly standardized for all patients in most hospitals? While I believe that many hospitals can treat. Breast cancer very well. There are many unique features about UCSF. You know, in the past, people used to believe that breast cancer was one disease, but now we understand that breast cancer is very many diseases. It's very heterogeneous. In the past, we used to just look at the size and whether or not your lymph nodes were involved to make a determination of. How aggressive is your cancer, and which treatments you need? And now we have more sophisticated tests, like molecular or genetic tests, that can really help us determine which patients are at higher risk of having a recurrence, which patients are at higher risk of dying from breast cancer, and which patients will really benefit from chemotherapy. And now we can even determine which patients may need newer targeted therapies. At UCSF, we take personalizing breast cancer therapy very seriously, and we believe in the importance and the power of clinical trials. And we have numerous clinical trials here that combine newer treatments with standard treatments, as well as newer treatments by themselves. And we really look at each patient's individual tumor characteristics to determine which treatment is best for her. Or him, and in particular, we have, for example, our neoadjuvant iSpy trial, which is really trying to select patients who we know have high risk and、mm-hmm. patients who will need at least chemotherapy and who will benefit from potentially newer drugs. And we're really selecting these patients specifically for this trial and allowing them access to many promising agents. That they otherwise would not be able to receive off study. So this is only available at UCSF, not elsewhere at Stanford or other hospitals in the nation. This trial is a multi-site trial, so there are twenty other centers throughout the United States and Canada that have it open. It is the only site in the Bay Area that has this trial open.、Mm-hmm. I'm sure other institutions may have other trials as well, but、mm-hmm. this particular trial is only open here at UCSF. So unique features, personalized breast cancer therapy. Now, sounds like if someone is diagnosed with breast cancer, it's worthwhile to go to UCSF. Do you accept patients from all over the Bay Area or anywhere in the nation? Absolutely, we accept patients from. Everywhere. In fact, we also have patients that come from out of state, so we are more than happy to see anyone with a diagnosis of breast cancer that lives anywhere, and we're very accommodating. So, if someone's diagnosed with breast cancer, it depends on how aggressive or how complicated it is. The person should seek help based on the situation. Do you recommend that? I do, and I'm a believer in having. Minimum multiple opinions, and even if a patient lives far away, but you have a complex situation, absolutely come here for an opinion, and we can work with your local doctor. But even patients who live further away with complex cases, I would encourage them to see one of our providers because we have many trials open that are testing newer and promising strategies. I know actually of someone who has breast cancer, but she lives in Davis, so it might be worth for her to come to UCSF. Who are some high-risk individuals to get breast cancer? Have you seen a trend、um, in patients in recent years? There are a number of risk factors that have been published about breast cancer,、mm-hmm. and there are major and minor factors. And obviously, I think the most major factor would be a genetic predisposition, such as a BRCA mutation, and there are other mutations as well. Then there are other major risk factors, such as if anyone has had prior radiation to the chest. Wall, for example, treatments of lymphoma. Sometimes、mm-hmm. patients have received prior radiation. 
Also, patients who have first-degree relatives who have had breast cancer under the age of 60, Mm -hmm. and when I mean first-degree relative, I mean mother or sister. Certainly patients who have had precancerous diagnoses, such as in situ cancers, and patients with dense breasts. Then there are other more minor risk factors, such as related to hormone exposures, alcohol, obesity. But I have to say that the majority of our patients that we see do not report any of these risk factors. In fact, only about 5 to 10% of breast cancer patients have a genetic or hereditary component to mm. their disease. So, it is worth noting that Asians actually have a lower incidence of breast cancer compared mm. to other racial or ethnic backgrounds. However, it's also noted that there is a slight increase amongst Asians in terms of the increased risk of breast cancer over the last decade or more, whereas that same increase has not been seen in other races. So that's really interesting, and Mm. we don't know exactly why that is. There's some thought that it might be due to environmental influences related to whether that is weight gain or dietary factors, reproductive factors. I know that's an area of research for many, but we don't know why, but that trend has been documented. So you're saying that only 5 to 10% of women diagnosed with cancer are genetically predisposed to have it, and the rest of the 90% or 95% really are random cases of people who just really have no reasons to get breast cancer in the first place. What I'm saying is that only in about 5 to 10% of cases can we identify the genetic predisposition where we actually can identify that it is because of a BRCA mutation or a P10 mutation. It doesn't mean that there isn't a genetic predisposition for others. For example, oftentimes we do get a patient who has a very strong family history for breast cancer and that Mm -hmm. their mother and their grandmother and their aunt had breast cancer, Mm -hmm. and we run the common genetic tests, and she's negative. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have a genetic or hereditary component. It's that we can't detect it. Okay, you'll be more specific. Um, About 20% of -hmm. patients will report a significant family history, but still, that's a minority. You know, the majority of patients still do not report a strong family history. So I think the take-home point is I don't think any woman should feel like they're immune to the disease because they don't have a family history. So because there are more cases of women being diagnosed with cancer, even though there's really no reason to getting it. Even though they don't have anyone else in their family with breast cancer. Okay, but then it could be other factors such as obesity, alcohol you mentioned, and other radiation, other factors. Right, but I wouldn't say that any one of those things is the reason that that patient developed breast cancer. I think if we discover that there is a hereditary component, I think we can say more confidently that that is the reason that patient developed the breast cancer. In the absence of that, we don't know. I think we could say that things like obesity and hormonal factors or dense breast may play a role, but is it that any one of those things actually caused the breast cancer? I don't think so. I think we don't fully understand that, and I think the reasons are very multifactorial and in many instances just not known. That makes things complicated. People really have no way of preventing yeah. it. So among right. your patients, how many people are finding that they have breast cancer these days, just like randomly? Just I mean, How are you supposed to know since there could be all kinds of multiple reasons besides maybe getting self-examination and going to hospitals to get mammograms? Well, those are the two ways to detect and diagnose breast cancer. So mm-hmm. all of my patients have breast cancer because I'm a breast oncologist. So I can tell you that I have patients who either they or their physician, whether that's their primary care physician or OBGYN, feel a mass on their exam or the patient had a screening mammogram Mm. and an abnormality was seen. So those are the two ways that patients are detected to have an abnormality that must require further workup. And usually by the time the patient is seeing me, they've had a biopsy that has diagnosed 
the cancer. The younger women tend to feel their breast mass as their first clue that something may not be right okay. because younger women probably haven't had their initial mammogram. And older women, many of them come in because of an abnormal screening mammogram. So how far do you think we are from having a better treatment for breast cancer than what's currently available? So just a little background, we have improved breast cancer survival by over 20% in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And that's due to really incremental and additive improvements. So I think we are constantly improving okay. in order to really change the treatment and improve the treatments for breast cancer. For example, in the last couple of years, we've approved three new drugs for breast cancer, which is really great, showing that these drugs can help women live longer with breast cancer. What do these drugs do just prevent the cancer cells from spreading or control the cancer cells from spreading? The three drugs I'm referring to, one is called Everolimus, and that is for hormone receptor positive breast cancers. And then the other two drugs are for HER2 positive cancers. One is pertuzumab and one is TDM1. And all of these drugs show that we can slow the growth of breast cancer and even in some help patients live longer. And these drugs were approved for patients who have advanced breast cancer, meaning that the tumor has spread outside of the breast area. This is an incurable situation. And so it's really important to find drugs that help women extend their life. And we're now doing trials to see if we can bring these drugs into the early stage setting so that we can help cure patients as well. So the three drugs you mentioned slow the growth of cancer. Is it just specific to cancer cells of the breast or in the breast area or just all over the body? Breast cancer cells that involve the entire body. That's good news. So then just controls the whole so whole body. Exactly. That's great. Yes. Now, what are some lifestyle changes or additions that you can recommend people to do to lessen their chances of getting breast cancer? This has been looked at in a number of studies, and it's very difficult to study lifestyle or behaviors. But in the limited literature that we have, there's been some studies showing that maintaining a healthy weight may help prevent breast cancer, and that's good for many disease prevention. And that would be, you know, having a body mass index less than 25. Similarly, exercise. And some studies have reported that even, you know, three hours a week of brisk walking could benefit women. There are many studies that have shown the association of alcohol intake and breast cancer risk. So I would recommend drinking in moderation. And those are the major ones. You know, obviously, I would recommend that patients refrain from smoking as well. Those are the major lifestyle factors that have the most data behind it. Yeah, there are things that you can really do readily, controlling the weight. For some people, maybe it's, you know, it's hard, but it's something you can do about exercising and drinking in moderation and quitting smoke. It's good for all different reasons, too. When it comes to treating breast cancer patients, what is the hardest part that you have to deal with? It's always difficult when we have a patient who has a very aggressive and resistant breast cancer Mm -hmm. who ultimately dies from the disease, and that's always a difficult situation. However, there's also challenges when I take care of patients who do well from the perspective of their breast cancer, but then struggle with the long-term side effects due to our treatments, and that could look different depending on The woman, you know, because breast cancer can affect all women, really. I mean, we see patients who are in their 20s and we see patients in their 80s and 90s. And so Mm -hmm. it really affects a broad spectrum of women that are at different stages of their life with different backgrounds and Mm -hmm. priorities and how the diagnosis and the treatment of breast cancer impact their life looks very different for each woman. So, for example, you know, for a younger woman who still would like to have children, and gets diagnosed with breast cancer and is recommended to have chemotherapy and other treatments that may impact her future fertility, that can be really difficult as well. Other patients struggle with long-term side effects from chemotherapy, such as neuropathy or achiness in their 
a joint mm. uh, or um, cardiac issues or hot flashes. Mm. So it's it's really different for each patient, and I think that can be a real challenging part of my job is to help each patient cope with both the short-term and the long-term side effects. Yeah, sounds like a lot of emotional factors as well that you have to uh, help patients with. Now, for the rest of us, what are some other breast-related diseases that we should be aware of? Well, there are benign breast diseases for sure, and things like fibroadenomas and cysts and infections. However, I think the take-home message should be that if there is any abnormality in the breast, whether that's detected by a self-exam or by a healthcare provider or any abnormality seen on breast imaging by a mammogram or ultrasound, that really should be followed up by your physician and to completion so that we know exactly what that abnormality was due to and we can say, okay, does that make sense? Is that mm-hmm. responsible for the abnormality that the patient found, or does that not make sense? And we should keep pursuing this until we find an answer that we're satisfied with. And I think while certainly there are a lot of benign breast diseases, I don't want anyone to assume that what they have is benign. Because remember, breast cancer can impact young women that think they're of an age where it would be impossible to have breast cancer. And unfortunately, we see a lot of women in their 30s and sometimes 20s, you know, women who are pregnant or women who are breastfeeding, where it's sometimes difficult to detect an abnormality in the breast during that time. But Mm. I want all women to be cognizant that breast cancers can develop at any time. And if there's something that just doesn't seem quite right, to make sure that you bring that to the attention of your healthcare provider. Sounds great. Is there a contact information that people can go to get more information for patients or for listeners who are wanting more information on this? I would refer patients to the Breast Care Center website at UCSF, which is ucsfbreastcarecenter.org. Sounds very good. Thank you so much for your time today. I know you're very busy and really appreciate your time. Oh, you're very welcome. This is my pleasure. 感谢您收听今天的节目。祝您有一个愉快的下午。我们明天同一时间再会。